everyone. It's great to be here at SALT. You know, we were going through many iterations how to start this panel out, but, you know, given the immense impact that the pandemic had on capital markets, the economy, society, and given that this is the first time we've all been together at this incredible celebration of investment excellence, we thought we would segue back to that and walk through what was going through the minds of some of the greatest multi-strategy uh, distressed credit and value investors on the planet as the pandemic started to kick in impact markets and as the recovery began. You know, so without further ado, I want to start with Peter Wallach at Sculptor. We're starting there because Sculptor, as you probably know, has an incredible focus on risk management, and that happens to be his title. Um, so, so Peter, as the pandemic started to evolve from just being a more of an epidemiological problem to more of an economic and market problem, how are you guys managing that process? What was going through your mind? How are you trying to protect capital during the acute stages of the debacle? Thanks so much, Troy. Uh, wow, it seems like ancient history, but um, it's still also a little bit fresh. Um, so we, we have a global reach at Sculptor, and one of the things that um, sometimes differentiates us is having that global reach is um, the ability to, to have a beat on certain theses in various corners of the market. Um, we felt very fortunate in the February timeframe of 2020 to develop a um, proprietary and at the time, thankfully, uh, accurate thesis on the scope and potential impact of the virus. Um, and as is, as is our typical um, practice, the combination of active risk management, portfolio management, um, and a lot of hedge overlays sort of combined to allow us to really take down risk in a hurry. Um, and what that means is we really, we, we cut long market value by half, we cut our beta by, to basically zero, um, our net to zero, and that really allowed us to play offense for a, a good portion of the um, early days of the pandemic in February, March, and April. Um, and when the, when the dust had settled, it seemed like one of the biggest um, opportunities was, was really getting off of the inertia and getting out of the sort of paralysis and deciding where to invest. And where we decided to, to place our chips, where we thought the highest and best use of capital was, was in safe spread across the, across the globe. So that's in corporate credit and structured credit, um, where you know, blue chips and blue chips in credit and in very seasoned borrowers in structured credit and mortgages were offered hundreds and sometimes thousands of basis points wide um, to where they had been into fundamental value. So, you know, within, uh, seemed like a cup of coffee, but in very short order, we had doubled our, our global credit exposure in the fund. Um, and then over the, over the remaining part of the year, we, we did the same within equities and convertible and derivatives. Um, but really it started with what we thought was a very compelling opportunity in, in some blue chip areas. Yeah, so Peter, the key point there would be help protecting capital on the way down helped you to go on offense on the way up, and you started with investment grade credit and worked your way down the capital structure from there. That's right. Now, now Jason, segueing to you, you're known as more of an alpha generative guy, you know, a big idea guy when it comes to idiosyncratic opportunities. How are you managing that process, given the much more idiosyncratic nature of your portfolio versus some of your competitors? Well, you know, we're, we're all, but we're distressed credit investors, and you have to understand, like, in March of 2020, we went from a relatively benign environment for distressed credit to having the largest quantum of distressed credit we've ever seen in the history of the world over the course of four weeks. Um, there was literally a trillion dollars, and I'm not just saying that to be dramatic, like people use the word a trillion, like there was actually a trillion dollars of distressed credit in the U.S. by April 20th of 2020. So that was one. Two, a lot of these businesses were completely healthy a month prior. So normally in our business, these capital structures break down gradually over time, and you have a lot of time to diligence them and prepare yourselves. Names don't go from 100 to 50 overnight. They go from 100 to 90 to 90 to 85, and you're starting to do your work and hire lawyers and do all this stuff so that you have conviction to invest in these capital structures when they finally break down. That didn't happen. We didn't have that luxury. A lot of this analysis needed to be done from scratch, businesses we never even heard of that now had first lien debt trading at 50 cents. Three, a lot of the tools that we use to invest in these capital structures, you know, our firm, we like to roll up our sleeves and get on airplanes and go meet with management teams and walk factory floors and talk to competitors and talk to suppliers. You couldn't do any of this. We were forced to be desktop analysts, which that, that's not our style. 
And also the way COVID impacted a lot of these businesses was, was like nothing we had ever seen before. Like I've been through a number of recessions and you see revenue go down 20%. There was industries where revenue went down 100%, more than 100% if there was contra revenue accounts, right? If you were investing in casinos or restaurants or gymnasiums or movie theaters, these businesses saw revenue literally go down 100%. There's no case study in business school to say, here's how you analyze these types of businesses. And then finally, and not to state the obvious, but while all this was going on, right, while you had the largest quantum of distressed credit ever, we were all told to go home and work remotely. And while we all got pretty good at that over time, initially when there was the most acute amount of distress, we were all figuring it out, right? You know, we were using Skype for business. Nobody even knows what that is anymore. That was, that was the video conference system that was downloaded on all our PCs and trying to figure out how to work at home with your kids running around and your significant other in the other room, and the emotional, stress and trauma that COVID impacted, particularly on younger analysts, you know, it was very challenging. So what did we do? What can you do? You just put your head down and work. You know, I sat around with my team very, very early on. I said, look, guys, this is our time to shine. It's not like you guys have anything else going on. We're all just sitting at home doing nothing. <laughs> so let's just you know, spend the next six months working as hard as we've ever worked. And that's what we did. We did 12 to 14 hour days every day, including weekends for the first 90 days. We drew all of our committed capital down, took all of our cash in our open end vehicles, and by the end of June, uh, we had we were, all of our funds were fully invested. And you know, there's a you know positive energy to the story. While it was incredibly stressful and uh, intense, you know, it ended up being very fruitful because you know those funds did very well over the ensuing 12 months. Yeah, that's great commentary, Jason. So, so Todd, we watched you in real time. Yep. Put the foot on the gas in in late March, early April really seize opportunities that you hadn't seen, you know, really since the global financial crisis. Can you walk us through that mindset as you're coming off a tough period and then it's time to go on offense and go after the most opportunistic uh, targets you see? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, mean, I would echo some of the comments here. I mean, I, I think the biggest struggle was really trying to figure out the time frame. Um, all the scientific experts were telling you this was going to go on for some time. You had no visibility on vaccines, obviously, at that time frame. Um, you know, any sector that was, you know, remotely touching on the consumer or gathering of people, be it retail or gaming or airlines, uh, travel, yeah. airlines, any of that, you know, you're sitting there going, okay, these businesses are literally running at zero revenue. And so it wasn't stress testing a company for an economic downturn. It was stress testing a company for... How many months of liquidity do they have with zero revenue? Mm -hmm. uh, and not surprising, particularly in the gaming industry or some of these other industries, there's a lot of fixed costs, a lot of operating leverage in these businesses. So they, they didn't look like they had a whole great degree of running room. Um, we tried to be very nimble. Uh, we rotated initially into a lot of these higher blue chip investment grade quality credits. Um, you could buy Coca-Cola, you could buy Apple, you could buy uh, you know Boeing bonds, things like that. Um, that seemed like good initial expressions. Um, and then as we got, I think, some more comfort and some more visibility into how to think about the virus by sort of May, June, I'd say, we definitely started rotating more into the travel and leisure space, mm -hmm. uh, focusing on top of the capital structure mm -hmm. and on, under the theory that, you know, if they did run out of liquidity, at least we were, uh, from a loan to value perspective, uh, you know, uh, well collateralized and well covered, we felt. Um, we also focused a lot on structured products. Uh, there were some very interesting opportunities. Naturally, those structures were, were levered and, and very exposed to the initial shock of the crisis. The consumer, um, the housing market. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, there were some mortgage lenders that you know had uh, needs for immediate capital uh, that by almost the time we were putting the documents together had already really started to come out of it because the Fed acted as quickly as they did. But those were some pretty interesting opportunities as well. Um, it was challenging, and I, I agree with Jason. We, we just got to a point where you couldn't go out and see the companies. You, you couldn't really um, you know, touch and feel what was going on, which is ordinarily what you'd like to do. Um, in many cases, you couldn't reach other people involved. They weren't in the office and that sort of thing. Um, so you really did just kind of put your head down and, and uh, try to power through it. And every day was intense uh, there for several months. It really was until the summer that it felt. Like there was a little bit of calm, you could take, take a breath. Somewhat more normalized. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But um, the timing is still to this day is part of the struggle, right? I mean, I was reading this morning, we're, we're 20 months into this uh, disease, if you want to call it that. Uh, they're talking about potentially new strands coming yeah. from Africa. I mean, 
without all this obviously. liquidity in the system, it, it, it would have been a very different uh, mm -hmm. dynamic. I think it would have dragged on quite a bit longer. God bless the Fed, fiscal yes. stimulus, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Leslie, we were joking around uh, before uh, the panel started about given the nature of what you guys invest in and the fact that it's not mark to market as frequently, you weren't as concerned about mark to market risk. And I asked you, what were you sweating? And, and your answer was? We were still sweating it all. Yeah, so <laughs> There's no sweating question. everything, right? And that, that, that was the key, right? So given how great Fortress as a firm is at investing in special situations, credits, can, can you walk us through when you, you as a firm and yourself became comfortable that many of those credits would make it and end up having really attractive, realized value? Because obviously mid-March, much more stressful. Maybe by April, you start to feel a little bit more comfortable. Yes, and as everyone has said before, it goes without saying, we were all dealing with personal and professional challenges. And, and the immediate thing was to, to make sure everybody was safe and then also to figure out how to work logistically from home because that was a new phenomenon for all of us. And what we decided and, and realized quickly um, was that we had two agendas. One was to preserve capital and protect our existing investments. And the second was to capitalize on what were opportunities, the likes of which we hadn't seen since the financial crisis. And so we needed to do both. And we made a, an, a, an immediate and very important decision, which was to invest aggressively and decisively rather than proceeding with caution. And with that as a backdrop, we mapped out for ourselves based on all of our prior experiences and the multiple cycles we've been through, we mapped out for ourselves what we considered to be or expected to be the three, three phases of dislocation. The first was forced liquidation in which we expected to be taking advantage of opportunities on the back of margin calls, redemptions, and fire sales. The second was illiquidity in which we expected there to be short-term um, cash needs in order to fill gaps and in order to fill the void where the capital markets were otherwise closed. And the third, the third uh, phase of dislocation we expected um, to be reconstruction in which companies were going to then have to rebuild their balance sheets and, and move on to, to the post-COVID world. So what we, what we determined was that March and April really were that first phase of, of forced liquidation. And, and they were quickly followed by the, by the phase of illiquidity, which went through the fourth quarter of last year. In that whole time frame, we were able to deploy approximately $10 billion. Wow. And it was a pretty major effort. And what, the reason why we were able to do that, and we were really able to invest right out of the gates starting in March, and the reason for that was that we have a team of 160 investment professionals worldwide, and we gathered them all up together. And the, that team has an enormous laundry list of names that, and library of names that, that, that they knew of credits, assets, securities of all kinds. And so people went back to the names they knew. They went back to what we considered to be the low-hanging fruit and started out really with stressed and distressed securities uh, in, in the corporate world, in asset-backed securities, we, went, we looked at broken, broken mortgage rates, et cetera, and we found opportunities based on names we already knew. So we weren't starting from scratch. This was not research, original research. This was reviewing names, and we were able to go back and assess the names that had the best risk-reward and pursue them immediately, and we were able to fill a void where there was otherwise no capital available. Yeah. That quickly then transitioned into investing in direct lending and buying into liquidations and buying other types of assets along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's really how, how we transition. And then ultimately, I think we, we feel like we called those three phases of dislocation pretty well. And if there was one mistake we made, it was actually the timing. It went way quicker than we ever would have imagined. Yeah, you would have preferred it go slower so you could deploy. Of course. Yeah. I mean, the Fed came in and took our jobs away. But but the truth is that that the phases went very quickly. And so the only regret is maybe that we, we could have, if we could have invested more, we would have, but, but time ran out. Yeah. And that being said, uh, we've, we've now moved into that phase of, of reconstruction, and, and that's where we are today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so why don't we segue now into the present? I think we all know that the macroeconomic environment and capital market environment is incredibly different than what you were all discussing. Uh, you have a Fed that's already starting to pull back liquidity underneath the, the scenes. Uh, a lot of people are unaware of how much liquidity has been sucked out of the system already and how much money supply growth has slowed. You obviously have a situation where GDP estimates keep getting ratcheted down, revenue growth, earnings growth. 
um, more uncertainty than usual in DC around future budgets. Uh, so in an environment where equities are 21 times forward earnings, you know, absolute yields on high yield are 400 basis points. I mean, can, can anyone in this room even imagine that two years ago? Um, you know, where are you finding opportunities today? And Leslie, why don't we start with you again? You can uh, jump in first here. You started to touch upon it briefly, but my understanding is a lot of it is off the run, esoteric credit, where today's best opportunities are in a world where vanilla assets are fairly richly priced. You're absolutely right. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we are now in the phase of reconstruction and in, in in some cases, even we've moved beyond that in certain sectors. And so there were lots of distressed and stressed opportunities in, in the public markets last year, and those have largely been resolved. So we have now regrouped and refocused our efforts on what we consider to be private credit. There are three areas that, that we're focused on in particular these days. Um, that I'd like to mention. One um, that I'd highlight is in private lending. The second is net lease, and the third is is facts. And the private lending would mainly be the corporate entities, corporate real estate, all kinds. Okay, but, all kinds. But in particular, on the on the direct lending, we we kind of bifurcated in our minds between middle market and and the larger scale. Mm -hmm. And on the middle market side, this has been our bread and butter since our inception in 2002. So this has always been a core part of our investing practice. But one of the things that really carried over from the pandemic last year, during that time, we were able to really expand our network of borrowers. And the reason why we were able to do that is because we were able to provide capital quickly, efficiently. We knew how to do it. We knew how to structure transactions. And we were able to be of service to, to all kinds of companies in their times of need. That loyalty has paid off. So it paid off in the during the pandemic, and it's now paying off now as well because we're actually finding that we're able to help provide capital to those same companies that are now focused on M&A and growth and restructuring their or refinancing their balance sheets. The other one notable change that's happened during the course of this year that I think is also worth mentioning and one that we're seeing and participating in is the larger scale transactions in the billion dollar range. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing the disintermediation of the, the commercial banks. Once upon a time, not too long ago, commercial banks were in charge of agenting and, and broadly syndicating such transactions. And what we're seeing now is an increase in, uh, in transactions where a, a handful of lenders get together and provide a borrower with a single solution that they're willing to do, that borrower is willing to do um, to pay a slightly higher coupon in exchange for certainty of closing, lack of flex in pricing, and efficiency. And so that's a, that's a major trend that we're, we're seeing this year, post-pandemic. So Leslie, it's almost like it's back to the future for Fortress. You know, you had your pandemic investing period where you killed it, and now it's back to the future doing what you were doing prior to the pandemic. And, and given those opportunities, what type of returns are we talking about for investors? And you know, I don't think there's any compliance. Pe oh, I see a compliance person. Maybe you can't say anything, but give us a rough guide on what you think is realistic. But, well, basically, it all is a function of what you do unlevered versus levered. That's that's how it, it basically works. So on an unlevered basis, we're still talking about single digits kinds of returns. But based on the financing facilities that, that we've put together in, in our various funds, it allows us to generate returns that are in the mid to high teens and sometimes wow. higher just as a function of, again, what our assets and liabilities are. So are set I, I got to get my slide rule out for this, but I think mid to high teens is a little better than risk-free right now. Just a, just a tad bit. I have to go back to the old school calculator for that one. But Jason, so we were talking about this before, and uh, you know, there's a narrative out there, obviously, that there's no distress, 400 over, or not 400 over, 400 absolute for high yield, you know, default rates have collapsed. Uh, but your point of view is that this is actually a great environment for a fund like yours because you can harvest a lot of the intellectual capital that you put in over the last 6 to 12 months. Can you, can you kind of flip that narrative on its head for us so we understand a little bit more what we're talking about? Sure. And by the way, I love getting invited to talk on a panel about finding value in distress when credit spreads are at all-time heights and the equity markets are at all-time all highs. But, you know, I, I would talk to generally... Um, Two themes. One, I would say macro versus micro, and two, uh, trading versus investing. I think this is the point point you're making about how, how you harvest these investments. So, you know, on the first, um, you know, we're not a macro investor. And, um, you know, distressed as an asset class is not something 
that we would invest in ever. Like even last year, it's just, it's a macro trade and it's not what we're good at. I think there's others that are, that are very good at it. Um, we're special situation investors um, with a focus on over leveraged capital structures. We're trying to find mispriced securities. And I think over leveraged capital structures lend themselves very well to that for a variety of reasons. They're opaque, they're in transition. You need to, under, you need to have a very unique skill set, contract law, bankruptcy law, negotiating dynamics. Management won't talk to you. They're illiquid. There's all these things and many others that provide, that allow these situations to be fertile hunting grounds for a strategy like ours. So if you told me, should I buy an index of distressed credit right now? This is the macro. I would say, absolutely not. You want spreads to be wide. You want the distress ratio to be high. You want the default ratio to be high. And we have none of those three things now. So a terrible beta environment, basically. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, know that it will get tighter or, or, or you know, who, who knows what's going to happen over the next year, but this is not a favorable risk reward for that asset class. But what we do have is a tremendous amount of over leveraged businesses. You know, when you keep interest rates low for 12 years, companies borrow. And coming out of the great financial crisis, we had a little over a trillion of levered credit and it's close to 3 trillion now. And if you look at average debt to EBITDA multiples at new issue over the last five years, it's all over five times. And by the way, that's debt to adjusted EBITDA. There's a lot of very aggressive addbacks to get to an adjusted, but it's probably closer to six times. Jason, are you seeing that private equity guys play games with EBITDA? Are you suggesting that? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, interestingly, we give them credit for some addbacks and we, we don't give them credit for others. We call them recurring, non-recurrings, but it's usually about half, but half of what they're adding back is kind of BS and half is probably real. So probably five and a half to six times. Um, so, you know, big opportunity set, you know, that, that, that's sort of the positive uh, macro negative. And then to your point, um, invest, you know, trading versus investing, you know, we're not buying things that are down 20 points, hoping they go up 10 points. I mean, we're trying to buy businesses through their debt. We're buying fulcrum debt securities, underwriting to a default where we can convert that to equity and own the business cheaply. And you have to understand that takes a long time. Right? It's usually like a year to restructure the balance sheet. Then the company's private and you own it. And now there's like a year or two where you start fixing it and putting new management teams in and incenting them the right way and, you know, shedding businesses and buying businesses. Then you go and exit. Okay, and this is what a lot of people don't get when they think about distressed return streams. Oftentimes, because of the way we're forced to mark these situations, it's a big J curve, right? Like you're usually losing money when you're buying these things. And then you're doing all this stuff to optimize the business and nobody's giving you credit for it because it's not a quoted you know, it never trades. It trades by appointment and guys are still quoting it from like an analysis that's two years old because it's private. And a lot of the return is made when you go and exit. And to exit, you need healthy equity markets and healthy M&A markets because that's usually the exit. So people look at our return stream because we had this more private equity-like approach to distress investing. And they're like, when I would have thought you guys would do really well, you'd do okay. And in years where there's nothing to do in distress, you guys kill it. I'm like, yeah, it's because we're selling things that we bought three or four years ago. And that's a lot of what we're doing now and what I think we'll I expect that we'll do over the next 12 to 24 months, not knowing what the market's going to throw at us. But I think a lot of things that we bought that we owned pre-COVID that we sort of navigated through COVID and, uh, and also things that we bought during COVID, you know, we'll be looking to exit uh, and that will drive a, lo a lot of performance. So it is somewhat counterintuitive with the approach that we take, um, you know, finding value in distress. A lot of times some of your best performance can be in years where you might think there's nothing to do in distress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Jason, you don't have to be as specific as Leslie was. Thank you for the specificity on the return expectations. But in an environment like this, what type of returns do you can generate for investors? We're, we're always trying to make 20. Mm -hmm. um, net, but right? 20 net. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, some, some of our funds have been successful at that, and you know, others you know, are in the Less teens. So. But that, that's what we're targeting. No. So, Todd. Yes. You're not asleep yet, are you? <laughs> sorry, sorry, it was a long time in between. <laughs> Very verbose. <laughs> sorry, dozing off there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so equity or credit? Right. And which sectors specifically do you think now offer the best value uh, in, in uh, your space? I, I think, you know, um, almost like Lee Cooperman said the other day, mm -hmm. uh, you see it really in credit and you see it in equities too. It's, it's, it's sort of all the other stuff. It's the value, it's the travel leisure, it's sort of the COVID hangover relics that I think you still find. There's still the catch-up trade. It's still a catch-up trade yeah. there. There's still a question mark about, you take a credit like Travelport, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is software for the airlines, communicate with travel agents. There's still a big question mark about when does business travel come back, yeah. travel in Asia come back, et cetera. Um, 
I think there are some very five years situations. Is, is the latest estimate right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which moves around all oh, the but time. Obviously, it keeps getting extended, yeah. and, and and you know the businesses themselves keep adopting to this new environment as mm -hmm. well. So you've got that going on real time also. Um, I think you know there's very much the haves and have nots in this market, mm -hmm. and, and I think in a way it, it it all stems from asset management has become so slotted with verticals you've got a lot of money in private credit a lot of money in distress a lot of money you know chasing these very well-defined mandates mm -hmm. um and what we try to look for as a multi-strat is really what's falling in between the cracks yeah. in between those verticals and cutting across capital and cutting across yeah. capital structures um I, I think you know without leverage it's difficult to say you're going to generate 20 percent net in this mm -hmm. environment but i think you take some structured products, opportunities where we're getting 10, 12% total returns. Still. Think, yeah, yeah, I think you still are. And some uh, interesting corporate credit opportunities, the travel ports of the world, or even the mall space, yeah. something like CBL, um, where there are opportunities to make 20 plus there because you're, you're playing in a more fulcrum security with mm -hmm. some real upswing, cyclical upswing when, when and if we come out of this. Um, and then there are you know, some interesting things in real estate. There's a lot of interesting things in the capital solution excuse yeah. me, part of the market, special situations, part of the market. We're working on a deal right now for a, a, a business outsourcing business, uh, sort of software, call centers, that kind of thing, that just sort of overstate its welcome on its capital structure. Yeah. You see a lot of that, where, where particularly in the private companies, they, they miscalculated. They didn't obviously see this coming. Now their capital structure is coming due in a year and a half, and mm -hmm. they've got to pay up to get some sort of short-term bridge-type financing, and you can actually get high teens-type total returns there unlevered. Um, but again, I think it's it's needle in the haystack. You've got to be nimble and kind of look across all these asset classes and really cherry pick them. I think it's challenging to be out there with this one dedicated mandate if you're not just kind of buying the market. There's just so much capital in the system. So anything in commodities still? Or have you faded that? Yeah. Pretty much faded that. We, we still have some of our offshore drilling equity exposure. Mm -hmm. Most of them have restructured. I um, think that space, believe it or not, is actually pretty interesting right yeah. now. Uh, well, it's very, part of the catch-up theme, right? Very much the catch-up theme uh, with these new capital structures and management teams are much more incentivized to act rationally, mm -hmm. take take non-performing boats out of the water, consolidation, um, you know, not holding out to try to make money on equity options with all this leverage from the past. Um, I think it's a little bit of a left for dead sector, which is interesting. Uh, but again, you're tied to oil prices, you're tied to the global economy. Yeah. Um, it should arguably be a very good environment for credit, stating the obvious, and that, and that is why spreads and yields are where they are. But on the other hand, it's a very artificial feeling stability. Mm -hmm. And so we're also running hedges to this day, you know, against just sort of broader market indices, uh, high yield as well as S&P on the theory that we're okay with the range of outcomes being here. We just don't want that yeah, ministry yeah. shock moment again. Um, we want to hedge that out as much as we can. Um, so what do you think that leads to for investors, net of fees? I, I think you can get to kind of, uh, again, we're running on leverage, so more like low teens mm -hmm. type return. 12 to 15? Yeah, yeah. I gotcha. think you can. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so yep. to segue to you, Peter, really quick, we've been talking a lot about corporate capital structures, but one of the focuses at Sculptor that many of you may be unaware of is they have a very healthy convertible bond uh, exposure and they run convertible bond arbitrage. They've also been very active in the SPAC market and yes, not every uh, SPAC is bad. You know, I think we can all hopefully agree on that. Um, and then lastly, you know, you've been buying more convexity recently. So I know those are three different topics, but if you could touch upon the opportunity sure. to convert, convert ARB, SPACs, and talk about how excited you are to buy downside protection as cheaply as you've done in quite some time. Sure. Uh, thanks, Troy. Now, now, the first thing is knowing what ballpark you're playing in, which is, I think, a pretty common aphorism. Um, and what you said is the first and second derivative of growth is slowing. The second derivative of st global stimulus is slowing. And so some of the places that we're interested in looking are places that are, one, potentially uncorrelated to just direction in the market, to whether it's credit, equity, et cetera. Um, another is uh, another fear and a common um, potential um, uh, tripping point could be um, the reemergence of inflation and a inflection point in in um, monetary policy here and, out and elsewhere. So a couple of the places that you touched on. So first with convertible bonds, and we like convertible bonds and SPACs for different reasons. Um, the convertible bond market um, right now, and particularly in Asia, um, has uh, very interesting pockets of cheapness um, that are 
uh, in some cases rarely seen. And convertible bonds broadly are a type of asset. It's a very big asset class that hasn't recovered nearly to its pre-pandemic level. And then also on a relative basis, relative to where credit and equities are trading, it looks even more attractive. And so with, with Asia, you have a lot of, you have a constellation of factors of regulatory, uh, a lot of exogenous factors, whether it's regulatory, trade, um, and, and sometimes liquidity and access to markets that we've been able to, to bridge. And you know, we're, we're seeing uh, types of convertible bonds that are trading multiple, multiple hundreds of basis points cheap to where they were trading pre-pandemic. And on an absolute basis, you can get uh, mid-single digits unlevered of cheapness. Uh, and then the way we do it in convertible bonds is we, we hedge the equity, we, we hedge the credit, we can hedge duration, we hedge term, we have some locked in term financing. And what you're able to do is on an unlevered basis, mid-high singles in some areas, which obviously levers to well into the teens for a non-directional exposure. So an interesting way to play Asia right now or some parts of, of, of China and greater China um, for, for, for that reason. Now on SPACs, uh, obviously for, for a different reason, we've been involved in the SPAC market for in various, in various forms for the last couple of decades. So not just over the last you know, 18 or 24 months. Um, and we've seen periods of euphoria like Q1 2021. We've seen periods of despair um, and uncertainty, somewhat like the summer of 2021 and October of last year. And, we, and everything in between. And what's interesting about that market right now is the ability to invest at uh, several hundred basis points uh, cheap to the cash in the trust. So you could buy cash in the trust at, call it, close to 3% discount. Um, and then with conservative leverage uh, and very little term and very little duration, you can access high singles, low double digits. And, and in a market where some people are doing that instead of, uh, potentially a cash investment. Um, and there's so many ways that you're getting some free options. You can have early business combinations as opposed to the one or two years that are expected. Uh, you could have a, um, a positive response in the public markets for a type of company uh, that the business combines with. Um, and then there's, there's more and more negotiations that are ongoing, and I don't think this is a secret, of sponsor economics can, can certainly be transferred in some, in some instances, given the supply demand imbalance. There's 130 billion of of SPACs out there that are looking for, for businesses to combine with. There's 30 or 40 billion that have announced but not yet completed. And a lot of these are trading at a discount. So I think that is a very interesting uh, short duration, uncorrelated, non-directional um, way to play right now. As, and certainly as part of one of the building blocks of our multi-strategy funds. Um, now the last point that you mentioned as far as always protecting the left tail, uh, we, we, it's, it's a building block. It's part of our social contract with investors. Uh, and it's part of our value proposition. And one of the ways we do this is through sourcing cheap volatility. If I told you that the last 30 days S&P vol is eight and the last five days is four, and you're able to buy implied protection on that for not much more than what it's realized, I think that people might be surprised at the relative bargain. So there are certain structures that we employ. Sometimes it's synthetic puts, sometimes it's others, where basically allows you to buy cheap volatility. And then when the flood comes, once again, you're not a forced seller, you're able to monetize the hedges and play offense. So that, that's one of the ways that, that we've um, used that as a complement to, to our investment, to our sort of broad strokes investment program. Great, great. And along those lines, Todd, what, what do you think the, uh, the biggest risk to markets in your strategy is right now? Is it as simple as Fed monetary policy shift or, you know, marginal tax rates going up to 60% plus in New York City? Or what, what, what would you pen it in as? I think those are all on the list. You've got to obviously put the pandemic on the list as mm -hmm. well, the virus itself on the list. Um, I, I think it's, at the end of the day, the valuations in the equity markets reflect a lot of uh, optimism about growth in the future. Uh, next year will be obviously a more challenging year to generate those comps year over year. Mm -hmm. um, if you spice that up with a little Fed restraint mm -hmm. tapering going on, um, you could definitely see Something maybe reminiscent of what we saw in '15, where you just get a a, a pulling back, general yeah. breaking, a in the sloppy, market, messy environment, which has so, so always that ripple effect. Hedges? Are you ramping up your hedges now? We have been, yeah, yeah we yeah. have been, and, gotcha. and and what we're trying to do really is uh, take chips off the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been looking for opportunities to monetize positions, uh, like Jason was touching on. Um, we have been trying to keep our investing very short term with a lot of endogenous liquidity. 
in the, under the theory that we get that money back, we can play offense in a more interesting environment. Yeah, more um, dry powder. And trying to stay higher in the capital structure, you know, um, but you never really see yeah. what that magic moment is. You know, we only have a couple more seconds. So, Leslie, are you guys getting more defensive now, or are you just sailing through? We are all we are defensive, but our whole DNA is basically defensive. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things we do, we try to stay at the top of the capital structure. We have a largely a variable rate. Um, portfolio. So we're not taking a lot of interest rate risk. And we look for a lot of idiosyncratic and uncorrelated risks and opportunities that are not market driven.